Good evening and welcome. I am Jeff Tomlinson. Thank you for joining us for this, our 10th annual Tupelo Reads event. Before our feature program, it is my honor to have you join in the presentation of the 2020 Helen Foster Award for Library Advocacy and Support. The Helen Foster Award was created as part of the Lee County Library's 75, 75th anniversary celebration in 2016. Named in honor of one of the library's very first board members, the award recognizes those members of our community who have made an especially significant contribution of their time and resources to promote literacy and learning through the Lee County Library. As you know, Mrs. Foster was a tireless advocate for the library and played an instrumental role in the library's founding in 1941. Another reason you may recognize the name of Mrs. Foster is through the Helen Foster Lecture Series, which was established by an endowment made by Mrs. Foster and which has been welcoming world-renowned authors and speakers to our community since 1974. Each year, the award goes to someone who continues this legacy of literacy and learning. This year's award was created by artist and one-time Tupelo resident Michael Ashley. Ashley's work is exhibited locally at the Karen Gallery in downtown Tupelo. I encourage you to play your part by contributing to the Helen Foster Endowment at Create Foundation. You may contribute in person at the Lee County Library or online at www.leecountylibraryfoundation.org. To present this year's Helen Foster Award, please welcome the Chair of the Library Board, Dr. Debbie Jones. I would like to say good evening to everyone. It is indeed an honor to be here today. But before I get into this award, I would like to say to all of those, the loss of the lives during the pandemic, also through the hurricane, the bad weather, and the fires. Our hearts are deeply saddened. On today, I am so elated to give information to not only this community, but throughout this state of two very important individuals in this community. They are pillars of this community. They are from Tupelo. They have worked tirelessly uh, through their deeds, their service, and their giving to the Lee County Library. You can remember them by their endowment for the youth. The Lee County Library Endowment Youth Fund was created by Dr. Dan and Ms. Frances Brassfield. They are exceptional, and it has been heartfelt, not only here at the library, but throughout this community. I would like to welcome them and also present the 2020 Helen Foster Award to Dr. Dan and Francis Brassville. Will you please come forward? Thank you so much. This is really a tremendous honor for us and certainly an unexpected one. Dan and I have been using the Lee County Library since early childhood, which is quite a number of years ago. And I have always loved it and been here through the different buildings and the different directors that we've had through the years. About 30 years ago, I was asked to come on the board of the Friends of the Library. And at that time, the organization was largely one that had an annual book sale and that sponsored Luncheon with Books and did refreshments for some things at Luncheon with Books and for the Helen Foster Lecture. Over the past 30 years, I have seen this group grow into a group that now has a number of sales each year. We have a bookstore that contributes its funds to the library and a major fundraiser. And the last few years, we've been able to contribute somewhere around $30,000 a year to the library for special programs and just to buy books which are not often funded by the state. I am very proud of the library. I'm proud to have been a part of this group and I thank you very much for this honor.
I'd like to thank Jeff and the Lee County Library for this honor, and particularly thank Frances for, after a number of years that she was on the, working with the Friends of getting me involved. Uh, as Frances mentioned, we've watched the growth and development of the Lee County Library over the years, using it as children and then working with it when we've been back here. It's been a privilege to be able to work with the Friends of the Lee County Library in support of the many programs and activities uh, of this wonderful library. I, want, I have to thank Jeff for his strong and dynamic leadership during this period. I also want to say that for me, working with the Lee County Library Foundation has been a very special privilege and I particularly want to, uh, along with Jeff, encourage everyone to consider the foundation for their gift giving, uh, for memorials, and for honorariums. Uh, it goes to support, all of this goes to support continued funding for the many tremendous programs that this library supports. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones, and many congratulations to you, Dan and Francis, for your continued commitment to the library. Now, back to our very special 10th Annual Tupelo Reads program. My sincere appreciation to all the members of the Tupelo Reads Committee. Thank you. Please welcome our committee co-chairs, Jack and Lisa Reed. Good evening, and welcome to the 10th annual program of Tupelo Reads, We're All on the Same Page. Obviously, we look different this year. Instead of a room full of people, we are coming to you via Facebook Live or on a recorded TV channel, but we are very glad to have you, whatever the format. And we do have a very few people in the library with us tonight, family members of the Harrises and Sarah Berry and a few committee members, so we're glad to have them here as well. When our committee met back in early January to select our book for this year, it was really a slam dunk to select this one. Usually we have much discussion and many choices, but it was a consensus that this was the perfect choice for our 10th year. Not only did we have a strong story written by a Tupelo author about two Tupelo heroes, but the story itself was so compelling, a story of grit and perseverance and determination and it was a love story and a happy ending. What could be better? But then we found ourselves in the middle of a global pandemic and it wasn't going away. So we thought maybe we'll cancel or postpone until next year. But then we thought, no, this is exactly the book we need for this time. So we decided to reimagine this event and make it virtual. And although I regret that we don't have 300 people in this room to show their appreciation for our honorees, we may even have a wider viewing audience with this format. Even, so, so, even though some of our usual activities around the book have changed a bit, they are still happening. Students at Tupelo High School are reading the book and will be watching this presentation and discussing it together in class. Books will be donated to the Boys and Girls Club of North Mississippi and art students at Tupelo High School collaborated to create this large image that you see behind Smitty and Louise of a jet plane similar to the one Colonel Harris flew. They researched the Vietnam War and then transferred images to the uh, plane and then unified it with watercolor and every student did one part of the jet. So that was an amazing collaborative piece that they did and they, they researched the war at the same time, plus read the book. Also, they did individual pieces, which we always give prize money, first, second, and third. So these are the three winners here. So you can see a lot of research and a lot of learning has gone on around the book. This program began 10 years ago as a way for Tupelo readers to dis to explore different literary themes and genres and to be enlightened by an author or an expert and to have a community conversation about a book. We've had speakers like Dr. John Locke, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Vanderbilt University on the book Tuesdays with Maury. Governor William Winter, who was a personal friend of deceased author Willie Morris, reviewed uh, Willie Morris's book, My Dog Skip. 
and authors like Winston Groom, Rick Bragg, Richard Grant, Stuart Stevens, Tom Franklin, and Beth Ann Finley. And last year, we moved out of our comfort zone of Southern regionalism to have New England author Ben Ludwig, who wrote, wrote a poignant but funny story about an autistic teenage girl named Jenny Moon. But this is the 10th year, so it's special. And as I said earlier, this is the perfect book for it. Congratulations to Sarah Berry for telling the story of Smitty and Louise and weaving their voices together so beautifully. If you haven't read the book, you really need to. So now, without further ado, I will turn this over to Jack Reed Jr. for a conversation with author Sarah Berry and Colonel Smitty and Louise Harris. Well, thank you, Lisa. Those of you out there can see why uh, when I was mayor, I asked Lisa to chair this Tupelo Reed Task Force. That's why it's been successful for the last 10 years, and hopefully uh, she'll keep doing it. Um, well, uh, I want to also thank the rest of the committee for soldiering on this year. Uh, some of them are in the uh, room with us, a few of them are in the room with us uh, tonight, although we're certainly trying to keep our social distancing. But uh, I agree with Lisa, of all the 10 books we've had, this is by far my favorite one. And uh, it's just an honor to have uh, Louise Harris uh, with us, Colonel Smitty Harris and Sarah Berry this afternoon, just to talk about the book. So we're not gonna uh, spoil the whole book for you, but we are gonna have some, some uh, I think some lively conversation about it. And, and hopefully if you haven't read it, uh, tempt you into reading it. If you have read it, give you some more enjoyment uh, from it. So. Let's get going. I, I want to say at the, at the first that, uh, fortunately, uh, Colonel Harris and I are longtime friends, our family are friends, so I'm going to refer to him as Smitty tonight, but I don't want anybody to think that shows any lack of respect. And Smitty, I appreciate your you. agreeing to that. Um, Louise, I'm calling you Louise, but I have utmost respect for you, too. And Sarah, <laughs> I have equal high respect for you. I'm calling you Sarah. Um, all right, the book title... I just want to read the, the title to those of you, again, who aren't familiar with and those of us who are. A True Story, A True Story, TAPCO, The Epic Survival Tale of a Vietnam POW and the Secret Code That Changed Everything. Colonel Carlisle Smitty Harris, retired, and Sarah W. Berry. But I think what, this set, what sets this book apart, and there have been other POW stories, is just as Lisa said, the weaving, Sarah, that you did of, of the home front as well. And just, uh, it honestly reads like a novel uh, with the, the drama of what was happening, uh, what uh, Smitty was enduring and trying to survive over there and what Louise was enduring and, and trying to make her way without any knowledge, of course, of how long this was gonna last or what was gonna happen. So Sarah, let's, let's start with you. How did you get involved in this project and um, what, what brought it to fruition? Sure. Well, first I have to say, as I have, they've heard me say a hundred times, it's been one of the greatest privileges of my life to help them tell their story. And it was, it was a co-journey uh, that we all did together. And, um, but the way it began is I, a dear friend of mine is their daughter, Robin, and she was over at my house one day and I had written uh, a few other books that she had read before. And she asked me if I would consider writing her parents' story. And at that point, though I had heard bits and pieces of their story, I did not know Smitty and Louise at that point. And my immediate response was, uh, I just am not qualified. You know, I, I was um, not born when Smitty was uh, shot down. Sorry, Smitty. But, uh, uh, and I just didn't know as much probably as I should um, about the Vietnam War. And um, Robin uh, asked me, well, will you just pray about it? And I promised her that I would pray about it. And we actually did together that day. And that evening, I picked up my favorite book, the Bible. And uh, I like to read that every day. And I like to read a version called the One Year Bible, which assigns the a selection of what you're supposed to read uh, that particular day. So that particular day, I opened it up to read that evening. And the sign reading was from Jeremiah. And it said, write it in a book, how the Lord delivered the captors uh, from, from the enemies. And that's my paraphrase, but that was a big 
aha moment for me when you see writing a book after you've just prayed about whether you should write a book. So, uh, so we, so I, I went back to Robin and I said, I will definitely try. My biggest fear was that I would not do this beautiful story justice. And so I'm thankful to the Lord that we were able to work. And then that started a journey of a year and a half of me having such the great privilege of being able to meet with Smitty and Louise for about a year and a half, I guess, and uh, just listen to their story. And I would have my computer up and, and we would just ask questions and get them started uh uh, reminiscing and I would just type while they uh, while they told me their stories and sometimes I would have to remember to type because I would get caught up in the story but it was just a great privilege and so much fun it's some of the some of the chapters were hard to write some of the chapters as I sat at my computer and wrote the the chapters tears would just be streaming down my face as I wrote it uh, it was a very emotional book to to help write, and I say help write because maybe, and this is a um, this is an encouragement to anybody out there. I know that there may be some young folks out there that maybe they have in the back of their mind that they'd like to write a book sometime, but this is an encouragement to them. Is that Smitty started writing his story back in the late seventies. And I think he had written down memories from about maybe the first two years of his captivity. And then he just stopped and I'm sure thought it would never go any further than those pieces of paper. But we were able to bring that out and and then weave in uh, Louise's story and then finish the years that he was he was gone. So, you know, that stayed uh, on a piece of paper hidden away in a file cabinet for I don't know how many years, <laughs> 45 or something like that. So anyway. Well, that's a, thank goodness uh, you and Robin had that discussion. And, and thank goodness you got uh, got it on paper and got it published. And uh, we all get to enjoy it. You, it's funny when you said, not funny, but it kind of humorous reminded me of something funny when you said, man, my favorite book, The Bible, I was in a uh, Women's League of Voters uh, debate once. In fact, it was up here in the library. And it was for mayor, not when I ran. This was several terms before. And one of the questions was to the two candidates was, well, uh, what's your favorite book? And the first one said, well, I'm a big baseball fan. I love the Stan Musial story. I mean, I, was, I just love Stan Musial and the Cardinal. And uh, and the next guy I said, what was yours? And he said, uh, well, of course, the Bible. And the second guy, well, I meant the Bible. I meant the Bible. <laughs> well, of course, the Bible. I was saying you can be second. So uh, he didn't want to get out-bibled by the, right. by the, by the, the other <laughs> candidate. But uh, anyway, all right. So um, so the book starts. And, and by, by the way, um, there'll be some pre-recorded uh, conversations, both with uh, Margaret Grants and Louise, coming after our live presentation tonight. If you just stay tuned to Facebook and then pre-recorded conversations with Colonel Harris and myself at the F-105 Veterans Park and at the Vietnam Memorial Wall that I think you'll find very poignant and uh, will be different conversations than we're having uh, here tonight. So do stay tuned for that. But the book starts on April 4th, 1965. Uh, Smitty, uh, the day you were shot down, just to tell us, to, to start, start right there. Tell us, tell us about that day and what, what you remember about that. I'm going to tell you about April the 3rd. Okay. First, uh, there was a very large bridge in built by the Vietnamese in North Vietnam, and it was the first bridge, important bridge, they had built since the French had been defeated in Dien Bien Phu in 1954, and they were surely not going to underbuild. They used huge steel girders and revetments to the whole bridge, and it carried both rail and uh, vehicular traffic. So it was an important target for us to hit. And so we went up on the 3rd of April, I forget how many airplanes, it was probably 25 or more, uh, F-105s, and we were carrying the ordnance, we call them bullpups, there were uh, rockets that you would fly your F-105 at about a 30 degree angle and you would fire off one of the rockets 
and you had a little stick over here that you could guide the rocket all the way to the target. So it was very accurate. But at the same time, you had to fly the airplane, and you couldn't jink or get away from, uh, try to avoid being hit by any aircraft fire or anything. And But you were so interested in what you were doing and doing it properly, any aircraft fire didn't even, it was not a consideration. Well, the bad part about that is when you finally hit the target that was hit, and you hit an afterburner and got out of there as fast as you can, except you looked over and you had a rocket on the other wing. So you had to go through and do it all over again. The bad part was that those little bullpup missiles didn't affect the bridge hardly at all. It may have broken some of the concrete on the uh, vehicular part, it could be repaired easily. And my flight was the last four aircraft to hit the bridge that day. And just in case it was still standing, my flight was armed. Each airplane had eight 750 pound bombs, which is pretty good ordnance. And uh, so, the, my flight of four went in and we got some hits on the bridge and we also tore up some of the approach to the bridge. And uh, we went back and made our, turned in all our reports and uh, we got word of, shortly after we got back that the squadron was going to hit the bridge again tomorrow, being April 4th, and all of the aircraft would be armed with eight 750-pound bombs each, and with an intent, of course, being able to take out the bridge. Well, uh, my squadron commander was Robbie Reisner. He was a Korean jet ace, uh, against MiGs, a wonderful Christian. He lived his faith and he was a wonderful leader. And fighter pilots just almost followed him around. He, he was such an imposing person. And he was my squadron commander. And as soon as he got the uh, word that the repeat the uh, same mission to Mars, except with different ordnance. He right away went up to the wing commander. We were flying missions out of uh, Thailand, Karak Air Base, and but our home base was on Okinawa, and the wing commander uh, was there in Okinawa. So Robbie Reiser right away gets on and calls uh, Colonel Cardenas and says, we do not want to fly the same mission at the same time, at the same altitude as we did today. Makes sense. Because every bit of trip, uh, anti-aircraft weaponry they could find, they were gonna put around that bridge and did so. And what we wanna do is come in low just at dawn, and so low that we'll be under their radar, they won't know we're coming, we'll pitch up to about 17,000 feet, roll over, and do our dive bombing run. And we practice this and we're good at it. You know what the Pentagon came back and said, told Colonel Cardenas? Fly the mission as ordered. So we came in at 10 a.m. in the morning at 17,000 feet. <laughs> they could see us on the radar all the way. And because my flight had gotten some hits on the bridge the day before, they decided that I would go in first myself in my airplane uh, and drop bombs because 
uh, it was in a, kind of a valley, and the winds were, were unpredictable, and they wanted to see where the my bombs would hit and then make some adjustments to their aim points. And uh, everything went exactly as I planned it. I rolled in at a 45 degree angle. I got the correct sight picture. I had all the switches set in the right places uh, and was flying the airplane. And at the proper altitude, I released all my bombs and started a hard pull out. Well, during that whole time, any aircraft first were all around me. And I knew it. But I, I guess I was a born optimist. <laughs> but anyway, I was so busy doing all the things necessary to make a perfect bomb run that uh, I couldn't even consider anything outside the airplane and the target. And just as I was pulling up and got the nose about level uh, and had afterburner going, trying to get out of there as fast as I could. And uh, some lucky anti-aircraft gunner had sent a missile up at my airplane and it struck in the engine area. I like to say though that I didn't like North Vietnamese missiles and I took that one out of <laughs> myself. <laughs> but at any rate, a single engine airplane uh, a hit in the engine area is really bad. And uh, apparently it cut the communication lines, the antenna lines that ran to the bottom of the aircraft up to the tail. And uh, also set the aircraft, I had maybe a thousand gallons of fuel on board. And a lot of it had ignited that. And so the airplane was like shooting rocket. And very quickly I knew as I was losing control, it got my hydraulics, my control surface. And uh, so just through training, I immediately ejected from the airplane because uh, that was my only chance for survival. It worked perfectly. <laughs> the canopy went off. Half a second later, the seat I was sitting in went way up in the air with me in it. And at the proper time, the seat was forcibly pushed away from me and uh, my parachute opened. I could have been unconscious from the moment I squeezed the trigger that started the sequence. Yeah. And the parachute would have let me down, um, you know, as well as a parachute. Yeah. So that's I don't want to tell the whole story. <laughs> well, I, and, I, and again, I, I know um, and there's some things that are in the book that you don't want to just talk about uh, freely. But I will say, just to kind of skip ahead, just for the for the readers and those of us who were who have read it, uh, you were immediately captured. Uh, you were marched around by the townspeople that came upon you. Uh, you just barely avoided a firing squad that day. I don't know if you want to re well, retell I, that. Or, yeah, uh, Louise, you I, may not I, want him to retell that. I don't know. Uh, when I landed, it was just barely on the outskirts of a large Vietnamese village. Not good planning. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were a number of Vietnamese who were very, very angry. They have correctly identified me as the pilot who had just bombed their bridge. And uh, one young man in particular who had a rifle, there were a few rifles, but mostly uh, hoes and sticks that the villagers had. And they came and pushed me up against a broken down brick wall that had been a building. And uh, this young man came over and put his finger here on my forehead, while three of his cohorts, about 
15 feet away were standing with their rifles ready. And I guess your mind just doesn't let you uh, realize what my main idea then, I had been stripped to nothing but my undershorts <clears throat> and was number one, looked like a military person from the United States of America. So I stood <laughs> as best attention as I could. And it's harder to do that in just your skivvies. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, I remember I started a, uh, a prayer. I didn't get to finish it. And I was just, it was almost as if I were watching a movie. I had no other, no control. Whatever was going to happen was going to happen. But just as the young man started to walk away from having his finger on my forehead, uh, there was a lot of loud talk and some older Vietnamese pushed in between me and my would-be executioners because the North Vietnamese were pretty well disciplined and their government had told them to capture Americans pilots alive. They're more valuable to us alive as hostages or whatever. And uh, so my life was saved. Mm -hmm. If it was a result of prayer, I can't say. But it did, certainly didn't hurt anything. No. Well, it was a harrowing <laughs> experience. Um, um, well, anyway, you, you were maybe you were saved to <laughs> To go on to some some pretty rough treatment, then you were interrogated, then you were taken to the uh, Hanoi Hilton to cell that was seven and a half feet by fifteen, which is not as big as this stage, probably. With you said, more like the size of this rug. Yeah, this rug, two concrete beds, um, and um, the next day you refused to apologize. The next day uh, you refused to write a letter to Ho Chi Minh apologizing. And uh, things didn't look too good. And Sarah, you've got, I think, on page 44, uh, I think one of the most uh, impressive, I guess, and inspirational parts of the book where you're, you see a crucifix that somebody in that cell years ago could have been during the French occupation, could have been prisoners there or something. But anyway, did in, uh, in your depression seemed to lift a bit. Sarah, read, read that uh, paragraph for us. But then I saw it. Glancing at the wall of my cell, the crucifix reminded me that I was not alone, and the sunrise sparked a ray of hope in my tortured mind. There will be a tomorrow. That simple thought brought with it a glimmer of hope, just as a glimmer of light shone through the barred window. Taking stock of my situation, I realized that I had gladly accepted the challenge to give my life for the things I believed in. I was not dead, but alive. My conduct in the ensuing months, perhaps years, was important to my country, my family, and myself. With God's help, I will prevail. Now is not the time to quit, but the time to fight. I would not quit. That's uh, that's in, that's inspiring. Obviously, it's inspiring. So uh, I want to get to the, the why the book is called Tap Code and why you're known uh, throughout the military history as the Code Bearer, which is Carl Harris's nickname uh, uh, still through the military. But uh, June 24th, uh, two months later, uh, the first day out of solitary confinement, uh, you're put in a cell with three other POWs and. Uh, and that is, again, uh, I say that's that's when the TAP code actually comes into use. So, so tell everybody about uh, the importance of that. I know that uh, in the uh, forward that Colonel Lee Ellis said that the, the two most important things to surviving were connection and communication. And that's what the TAP code uh, permitted for POWs to stay alive, both mentally and, and spiritually and emotionally. And uh, so t tell us about the TAP code. And okay. I learned the TAP code uh, quite by accident. As a matter of fact, an instructor at Escape and Evasion School at uh, Reno, Nevada, was telling us about in World War II, 
uh, prisoners held by the Germans, American prisoners, had been able to tap on a common water pipe and communicate to a building with other POWs in it where they could hear the sound that was carried through the pipe. And by chance, as I walked out of that class, the sergeant who was teaching the class uh, happened to be walking beside me. And uh, I said, how did they send the dashes? Thinking it was Morse code. And that's awfully hard to do on a flight. So he said, oh, I should have explained. It was not the Morse code. It was the tap code. He said, you have a minute. And he took me up to the board and showed me the simple five by five matrix of the alphabet, uh, which you read about in a book. But as soon as I was put in this cell with three other POWs, the four of us, uh, I remember learning that tap code. And we were, had all been held in solitary confinement, but in cells next to each other, separated by 18 inch or so concrete wall. And we could tap on that wall and it could be heard in the next cell if somebody put their ear to it. And uh, so I taught the others the tap code in case we were put back in solitary confinement. Well, the reason we were put all put together was they wanted some propaganda advantage from us. And so we all wrote a letter. They permitted us to do so and uh, took them from us. And a day or two later, we were back in solitary confinement. And those letters, incidentally, let me let, me let Louise tell you um, how she got her first letter from me. Well, well, Louise, go ahead. In August of that year, um, Mr. Livingston, who was the postmaster here in Tupelo, called me and he said, Miss Harris, you're going to think I'm nuts, but. I think I have a letter for you from your husband. And I said, you are kidding me. He said, no, I'm pretty sure it is. And he said, if you'll meet me on the back steps of the post office, which is the one downtown, he said, I'll give it to you. Well, I called my niece over from next door, jumped in the car and raced to the post office. And sure enough, it was Smitty's handwriting. Well, I could barely restrain myself, but I wanted the children to see me open it. So I got them and called my sister. She came home, but I didn't wait for her. I'd opened the letter by then. And the children were all huddled around me in the middle of the floor. And my niece was there. And sure enough, it was a letter from Smitty in his own handwriting. It was the, one of the few real letters that I had. And of course, it was, it was propaganda because he said he was in good health and receiving adequate food and that they were treating him beautifully. Uh, but it was him, and he was alive, and up until then, he'd been called missing in action. I was thrilled beyond belief to have that hand letter that he held in his hands was now in my hands. So I immediately called his mother and father, who lived in Maryland, and called my mother and my grandmother, who were in Florida, and then I called the Pentagon, and I said, Guess what I had? Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, when they said, well, we want to see it, and we want to see the real letter, I said, mm -hmm. no, I'm not so <laughs> sure. But anyway, um, they promised they would get my real letter back to me. And after I found a copying machine and copied it, I sent them the real letter. But they changed his description to detained by hostile forces. No prisoner of war moniker at that time yeah. but I have a letter and it even though I knew in my heart ever since the day they told me he was missing in action I knew he was alive I just knew it but anyway now I had verification and it was a beautiful time 
And our children were so excited, even though they really didn't know what the heck that meant because they were four and a half and three and Lyle was just a baby, but he was thrilled too. He didn't know what about, but he was thrilled. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we were we were an exciting yeah. family and mm -hmm. life was wonderful. I know so, that was a highlight. Yes, um, it was. One of our pupil friends, Sam Agnew, sent me a note this week that said, by the way, if you get a chance to mention this, the tap code is mentioned in a, a current uh, Netflix show called The Flash, uh, and he's got the article and everything. I can give it to somebody if, you, if you're interested in it. But that it's the one of these superhero movies now is still referring to the to the tap code. So wow, it goes, it goes on. Well, please let's back up just a, a little bit before that, just because I know people are interested in um, how you and the children managed to get back from Okinawa to. America and your long flight and your uh, stalwartness, your yourself and, <laughs> and having that. Is what I really did. Uh, <laughs> well, whatever that, that strength came from, and I, I, one of the lines I loved from the book was when they came to tell you that he had been shot down, and they tried to, or maybe they did, just put a sedative in your mouth, and you said, "I don't need a sedative. I need to be strong for these girls." Yes, and. Yes. Um, and that was just from, from the, that moment on. I mean, you were a tower of strength, too. And I remember you said your motto was, if he can do that, I can do this. I could. Um, and that, that was what my mantra became because it had to be. Yeah, yeah. I need to remind Lisa that when I'm having to work 24 hours at Christmas time. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe not quite as serious a challenge, but uh, anyway. Uh, and, then, and then Lyle was born a month later. Uh, and then uh, you all leave for home. Um, and the Steel Magnolia comes home to the Magnolia State, and pretty quickly uh, you have a, a conversation with the, your Air Force handler that I, I hope you'll tell well, me. That I actually know. happened in Washington. But, uh, you, you know, you just uh, you have to straighten up and fly right when you need well, to. The, 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 but the, yeah, but the, the point, I guess, is what I was saying, not only was this important to you and your family, uh, handling how the money was going to be, be handled, but it ended up being a, uh, absolutely the, the first opportunity for the Air Force to change that policy to yes. to, to treat other uh, spouses in your situation. So so to relate well, that story again, that's just a wonderful story. We get on the airplane in Okinawa. I waited till well, I was six weeks old, and I'd made up my mind what I was going to do, and because my sister... Janice Blake and her husband Dick were here in Tupelo. I thought that was the logical thing. Should something happen to me, that they would be the logical people to take care of the children. And so uh, I was coming back to Tupelo to live, or to Tupelo. I'd never lived here before. But I wanted to go first to uh, the eastern shore of Maryland to see Smitty's parents. So we landed in D.C., and I'm greeted by this little apple cheat lieutenant who his first mistake was to tell me that he didn't want to go fight. Yeah. So that kind That's of a brave set way me to start off. the conversation. <laughs> no. So anyway, he's also announced that I would now be given three hundred and fifty dollars a month at the discretion of the Secretary of the Air Force. And I said, Why is that? I said, I receive a hundred percent of my husband's pay. And he said, No, ma'am. Secretary of the Air Force has decided that you will get $350 a month and the rest will be held on a savings account at a nice rate of, net, rate of interest. And I said, wait a minute. I can't support three children, put a roof over our head on $350 a month. And I have allocated by my husband's power of attorney that I will receive 100% of his pay. And he said, no, ma'am, the Secretary of the Air Force is. I said, Okay. When we get to the eastern shore of Maryland, where my husband's parents live, you will get him on the phone, and I will explain it to him. He said, lady, I can't call the Secretary of the Air Force. I said, well, you will. You can do the dialing, and I will do the talking. <laughs> and so he said, I can't do that. And the whole way driving up, the children had gone with my mother and Smitty's parents. He was saying, I can't do that. I can't. This is a man who's not willing to fight, even though he's in the Air Force. But anyway, we get to the, to the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and the children are with their grandparents, and I said, you give him a phone. And he kept saying, I said, you dial. 
I'll talk. So he finally, after many convolutions, gets him on the air, on the telephone. This is the day of the black telephone that you hold like this. And so I told the Secretary of the Air Force who I was. He said, yes, yes, yes. And I said, I understand that you have ruled that I will get $350 a month and the rest will be put in savings. And he said, yes, that's my decision. I said, not acceptable. I said, I'm a former uh, legal secretary and I have a full power of attorney. If I can want to, which I don't, I can sell the children. But I can't support them on $350 a month and put a roof over their head and take care of them as my husband desired. And I said, that's just the bottom line. And he said, well, I think my plan is a good one. I said, I don't. And I will not have it. And you have until 5 o'clock today, close the business, and to change that plan because I have been getting all of his pay while I was in Okinawa. And either you call me back by close of business today or I will call a press conference. And he said, well, Miss Harris, I don't think that's reasonable, and I'll get back to you in a week. And I said, no, I've got today. I'm extremely tired. I have a four-and-a-half-year-old, a three-year-old, and, three and a six-week-old baby in my arms. And I said, by o'clock today, I'll be expected to hear from you. And I said, bye. And I hung up the phone. <laughs> so the phone rang about, I guess, two hours later, and he told me who he was, and I said, yes, I've been expecting your call. And he said, I've been thinking about your situation, and since you have the legal documentation, I have decided you're right, and you will receive your full payment benefits. And I said, that was a very good decision, and thank you. But it all worked out as was planned. So. Well, that's a, that's a that's a wonderful story. And again, this, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, I mean, there's persistence and dedication and strength on both sides of the uh, on both sides of the Harris's story for those almost eight years. Um, there are a couple of other stories, Louise. I, we'll see if we have time at the end. But the uh, the car story about uh, where the, the car was you really had you had really had a, a wonderful. Uh, not take no for an answer. Uh, uh, ended up talking to the, the president of, of General Mr. Motors. Yes, yes. Uh, very understanding person. Tell, also. tell the, give a quick ver give a quick version of the, the car story. Well, I had ordered one in Okinawa that was supposed to be delivered to the port of New Orleans, and I paid for it. And when it the call came that it had been delivered, it was delivered in the port of Baltimore, and I said, No, no, it's supposed to be in New Orleans. And they said, Sorry, ma'am, it's in the Port of Baltimore. So I got off the phone and I had planned that I could drive, I could get a Greyhound bus and be in New Orleans and get back just, you know, in a short period of time. And I was leaving my sister, who was very, very patient with me, uh, with three small children. But I couldn't get to Baltimore and back in, in a short period of time. And her hair was turning as gray as mine. Uh, so anyway, so I thought, what can I do about this? I, I can't go beyond three days to get this car. So I thought, well, my grandmother always told me go right to the top. So I called Mr. Estes, who was president of General Motors, and I called him collect. <laughs> <laughs> and when I finally was talking, and in those days you had to go through the operator. So I was talking over the operator who was trying to, and I said, I, you know, I'm, in this situation and uh you know you're gonna have to help me and so finally he said i'll accept the call operator so i told him that i needed his help and what had happened and he said you're kidding and i said no i'm not kidding and i need i need a car and i can't go to the port of baltimore to get it he said miss Har miss harris do you have a general motors dealer in tupelo mississippi and i said yes i do just down the street from me he said, well, you go to George Ruff Buick and you tell them your situation and you give them this code. And if they need me, you call, tell them to call me at this number. But you go pick out any car on that lot. And I said, well, I've only paid this much. He said, I don't care. 
you go to that lot, you pick out any station wagon on that lot, and you tell them I said so. If they have a problem with that, you can have that car. Well, I went down to George Ruff, who was a genial soul, and he said, I've only got one station wagon. It's fully loaded, and it's yours. <laughs> so I drove home in my beautiful, beautiful, loaded Buick station wagon, and I was happy. <laughs> Another example of going to the top, and um, and if, if people watch uh, some of the extra footage, if they watch on Channel 198 on Friday at 7 o'clock, uh, there'll be some, some some more conversation, too, and I think that will include the VA loan, where, you, where <laughs> Senator Stennis uh, got involved, and the next morning, the head of the VA in Jackson was on your doorstep in Madison helping yes. you make that loan. Well, Smitty, just so we, we don't get too... Uh, too jovial about things up here. Let's, let's talk just about for a minute about the seriousness of, of what you had to endure and probably the, according to the book, the toughest year you had, which was um, back at the uh, summer, what you call the summer, what the different POWs and you call the summer of horror, which was 1969 following the failed escape of some prisoners. And the Vietnamese, uh, didn't, they weren't too happy about that. It almost resulted in your your demise. Tell, tell us well, about that. Uh, that was kind of difficult. Um, That's an understanding. During our whole way, time that we were held as POWs, uh, they tried to find ways to exploit us. They would want us to uh, write letters that the treatment was good. <laughs> Think of the irony of that. Yeah. And uh, or to meet with delegations that were anti-war, and we would re refuse to do that. We refused to do anything that they wanted us to do, and it resulted in torture until we did something. But that something was the English language is so rich, we have so much slang, that the things that we finally were tortured to write, we had put in so much extraneous stuff that at the highest levels of their government, their intelligence, they knew that it would be counterproductive to try to publish those in any way. So they actually didn't. There was, I'll mention one yeah. exception. There was a Navy pilot named Nels Tanner who was uh, forced to write, and they told him what to write. They wanted him to write that two of his uh, shipmates were anti-war activists, and that they had influenced his entire Navy squadron to refuse to fly combat. They liked that letter because he had written it, no slang, no double meaning, no nothing. As a matter of fact, they took that letter to Stockholm to the War Crimes Tribunal headed by Bertrand Russell, which was really a communist front, and read his letter to the world. In it, he named the two anti-war activist pilots on his ship. First, how did he get shot down if his squadron had refused to combat? That was one thing wrong with the letter. The second was, he named those two pilots. They were Dick Tracy and Clark Kent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still great creative in the He, in he was thing. treated you know, yeah. badly. <laughs> well, you, I think it said it was 120 degrees in the cell that summer. 120 degrees, Sante, I think was as big as the camp you were in that summer. And um, you went down to under 90 pounds, said your your knees were bigger than your thighs. Well, yes, I had had trouble with uh, diarrhea on a number of occasions due to food that, as all, many of us did. But uh, one particular time, the time you mentioned, uh, I got really ill. Uh, I don't know what it was, but I couldn't hold food down. 
if I tried to. And I, of course, I had the usual infection of diarrhea. And uh, so my weight started dropping off. When I was shot down, I was 5'10". I'm 5'8 now. But <laughs> just eight. Yeah. But uh, I weighed about 165 pounds with very little body fat. I was uh, in pretty good shape. Most of my time as a POW, I, we didn't have scales, but I probably weighed somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 pounds or so. But this time, my weight dropped from that, and they would let us out of our cells to go uh, dump a bucket or whatever, one at a time, because they uh, didn't want us mingling with other POWs. They didn't want other POWs to know or even see us, but uh, they had seen me, and uh, I was wearing just shorts, no top, beastly hot, covered with fresh, and they guessed as I stumbled along with my bucket that my weight was probably less than 90 pounds. Hmm. Uh, I, I was sick in bones. I was sick. But the senior ranking POW in that camp was a Navy pilot named Nels Tanner. And uh, he passed the word to our communication system in the camp. There were about 40 POWs separated in three different buildings and uh, the most two men to a cell. And he passed the word that every single POW who was taken anywhere where there was an English speaking Vietnamese to tell them if they didn't do something for Harris, there was gonna be so much hell raised in the camp that their superiors in Hanoi would be upset. A hollow, hollow thing. But the whole camp did that and within just maybe two or three days, every POW who had, a lot of the Vietnamese were encouraged and taught English. They didn't do a good job of it, some of them did. But told them that story. And every single guy in that camp knew that they were revealing our communication ability because we were all saying the same thing and we were going to be taken out and punished, tortured, to find out who was the senior ranking officer, who made that decision, and how we were communicating and how everything was going in the camp. And every single one of them. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and just an example of, of people in duress themselves, that camaraderie and that sense of uh, we're all in this together. Just, uh, yeah, that, that's just remarkable. Uh, that, that's just, uh, that, that's one of the. There's a better ending to it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Within about, I guess, uh, two more days, uh, they took me out to put me on the back of a truck, took me to a some kind of medical aid station where they actually had a fluoroscope. And I drank the white liquid or whatever it was. And on the way back, uh, my interrogator went with us, an English speaker. And I said, what did the doctor find? He said, your intestinal tract is inflamed. <laughs> well, uh, that was pretty obvious. I had a serious problem. Yeah. But following it didn't take that, my berry to figure that out. <laughs> following that, they started giving me shots twice a day. And I asked the interrogator uh, what they were doing, and he said vitamins. But I'm pretty sure there must have been some antibiotics. Yeah.
uh, in there too. And it took me about maybe six months. They gave me some special food for a while, better food, which I shared with my cellmate. Oh. And uh, it took me about six months to get up, back up to my almost my normal POW. 120. Food. Well, uh, there's so many stories. Like this book is just full of stories. We're going to kind of get toward the, the end now because it is a love story. It does have, this book does have a happy ending. And Sarah, why don't you read a little bit for, for us some of your, just your loveliest writing, I think. Uh, this is on uh, page 199 when Louise is in Washington with some other POW wives at what they called Operation Homecoming, trying to prepare them for uh, what, what, what situation should hopefully occur because the Paris Peace Talks were on and it looked like POWs would be coming home. Read that for us. That's just uh, beautiful writing and, and Louise, a beautiful story. What has changed in me, I wonder? Of course, it is inevitable that the children have changed, I reason to myself, but have I? I looked at my hairstyle that was longer and styled differently than it had been the last time I saw Smitty. I was wearing a teal polyester pantsuit, which was a bit of a change from the stylish cotton dresses of the mid-60s. Leaning closer to the mirror, I wondered if my face had changed. I saw a few tiny lines in the creases of my eyes, and there was a faint line in my forehead. As I had experienced the changes of time, little by little, I couldn't really discern which of those changes would be surprising to Smitty. Not only did I wonder, uh, not only not only did I wonder, is he the same, but I also wondered if he was would think I was the same. Deep down, I knew I wasn't. I was stronger, tougher, bolder, and more responsible. I could only hope that he would find these changes desirable. Nonetheless, I had no fears. Whatever we faced, we would work through it together. Yeah, that's beautiful. So um, anyway, Smitty, just take with, you know, I guess, uh, and to the extent it can be quickly such good news. Um, February 12th, 1973, the flight out of Hanoi. Tell us, uh, tell us how you felt that day. Well, uh, we knew we were coming home. As part of the Paris Agreement signed by Kissinger and the North Vietnamese representative in, in Paris, uh, that we had to be notified by a certain date that we were coming home. And uh, the North Vietnamese did that. So they, I was in a, a camp up near the Chinese border. They spread us around. And uh, when we were pretty sure, because uh, we had heard over our speakers, loudspeakers that they tried to give us their propaganda every day, uh, that the peace agreements were on and uh, things got a little better, uh, a little better food, and we were all put in trucks and taken back to, from the, up near the Chinese border to Hanoi, to the big main prison there, and we were pretty sure we were going to be going home. And in when we got to Hanoi, to that prison, we were able to see posted that we were going to be released. And of course we were ecstatic, but we were so inured to the treatment of the North Vietnamese that we would never let them see any joy or smile or recognition when we were released. Uh, they outfitted us with some better looking clothes for the trip back. Uh, they put us in buses and then when the first time we were ever moved that we weren't blindfolded. And we the buses took us out to Guillaume Airport, the main airport in Hanoi. And we, we never smiled. We didn't talk to the guard who spoke a little English, but when we got off that uh, bus, we lined up by height, and the senior ranking person on the bus marched us to wherever we were going to go. No smiles. When we got to the table where there was a, 
a United States Air Force colonel and a couple of Vietnamese, one of them, one of our torturers, uh, were sitting by the table. We were stoic. Each of us had a escort officer, United States officer, to take us out to the airplane. And uh, we marched out there. We never smiled. We got on the airplane. We still didn't smile. They could have gotten us off of that airplane, put us back in the trucks, and taken us back and put us in solitary confinement. We would have never changed our expression. We knew we, they knew we hated them and why. And we weren't going to give them the satisfaction of even a grin. And it wasn't until the wheels came up in the airplane that we finally let out a scream. <laughs> yeah. There were some great nurses on board. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, Mike and Louise, February 12th from the home front. We well, were watching TV. Oh, yes. And it was it was a thrilling time. And yet it was blocked in our area until later. And I about had a nervous breakdown. Mm. But finally, when it came on TV, we were all just huddled around the TV. And Lyle went up to the screen and... I don't know why he was concerned about this, but he was. He wanted to know if his dad was going to have any hair. The last picture <laughs> of Smitty, his hair had been all yeah. put close to his head because of his helmet. And he went up to the screen and he got right up there and he put his finger on the screen. And he said, he does have hair. <laughs> <laughs> so it was exciting. We were all thrilled and everybody was talking at once. And the family was gathered all around the TV. It was so thrilling to see him come off that plane. I know. And he, he was, he looked to be in good health and we were just ecstatic. And we knew they were going to take him to Clark first. And so it would be several days before yeah, you could see him. First. And, uh, but we, we were, and we knew that they would be calling us. Yeah. And so and we that were, was the next day, February yes. 13th. We were just huddled around that phone. Well, let me say this. If you can read this book without tearing up during this phone call, you, you, know, you better go to the cardiologist because your heart is not there. It's, you don't have one. But go ahead. Tell us about that phone call. But it was so funny. The phone kept ringing. All the reporters and friends and everybody kept calling. And I kept saying, I can't talk to you. I can't talk to you. I'm waiting for Smitty. So finally, this fellow who was a good friend of ours, Rudy Durano, called and he said, Hi, Louise, it's Rudy Devon. I said, Rudy, I can't talk to you. I'm waiting for me. He said, don't hang up. Don't hang up. I've got him right here. And in that moment, I thought, please just let him say something that lets me know he, he remembers like I remember. And once when we were dating, he had introduced me as James. <laughs> so I pick up the phone, and he's on the other end, and he said, and I called him Tarzan. He said, hi, James. This is Tarzan. <laughs> Yay! It's all good. Yeah. It was the most exciting moment. It, you know, the whole family was just bananas. So it, life was good. And everything was perfect again. And just in that moment, all those eight years had gone away. And I knew our life was just at go again. And it was. So... He remembered as I remembered, and it, it was perfect. There's just no other way to describe it. It was perfect. So, well, there's a love story. And Smitty just, and of course, y'all, uh, February 16th, the family gets to you yes. come to the Maxwell Air Force Base, and the picture in the book is just wonderful of you in the back seat, Louise looking and Smitty speaking as the commanding officer of that. Uh, uh, that day, when people need to read the book, see that. But I just want to say, Smitty, the last line I wanted to, to, to mention today was that after uh, you and Louise got to spend three days together um, after debriefing and reconnecting, and you said it was as if I had simply taken a walk around the block. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh,
Sarah, thank you. Smitty, oh. Louise, thank you all. Well, she, we've adopted Sarah. Uh, well, that's, <laughs> that makes sense. that's a good choice. That's a good choice. <laughs> um, and I'm down just for those of you who, who are on Facebook Live or uh, watching uh, on Channel 198 later on. Just keep running, not just this Friday, but Alan Begay's Premier Productions is going to keep running that, uh, rotating it. Um, we're going to go to some pre-recorded conversations with uh, Louise and Smitty at the library and at the, the jet and at the wall. But uh, thank you all for, for being a part of this virtual uh, uh, TAPCO, Tupelo Reads, Read. I think it's the best one we've ever had. And I, if you're at home and those of you here, hope you'll join me in leading a standing ovation for the Harris. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, uh, the book selection for Tupelo Reads 2020 is Tap Code, uh, the epic survival tale of a Vietnam POW, and the secret code that changed everything. It's a wonderful book, a wonderful selection. I've read it two times. I've memorized <laughs> some of it. It's, uh, it's a story of patriotism and courage and faith, especially uh, when you think about Smitty as a prisoner of war for so long. But your story is also very compelling and very inspiring. First of all, would you tell me how you got from Okinawa to Tupelo, Mississippi? Exhaustively. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I had had our son, Lyle. Our, yes. Smitty was shot down on April 4th. He was born on May 14th. Right. Mm -hmm. And I decided it was, well, I'd already made up my mind where I was gonna go and what I was going to do. And by then he was six weeks old and it was time to come home. And I knew that if something happened to me, that my sister was the logical and her husband uh, were the logical ones to take care of the children. Uh, Smitty's parents were elderly and not well. Right. And my mother, although she would have adored the children and my grandmother would have said, you little darlings, you can do whatever you want to. Right. And so <laughs> Janice and Dick had teenage children and they would have been the best place. And I had visited in Tupelo, though I had never lived. Yes. I thought this would be a very good place. And it was a wonderful, wonderful choice. Tupelo was the perfect home. So we boarded a plane for that long, long flight. Right. And uh, the Air Force always offered to have someone accompany you, but it yes. would have been someone from our squadron. And they were under terrible stress. So I said, no, we will be fine. And we were, and it was about a 46 hour flight. But we went first to the Eastern Shore of Maryland, well, actually to Washington. Right. And uh, we were met there by Smitty's mother and dad and my mother. And they were thrilled to meet their new grandson. And of course they knew the girls, but they were just delighted to get their hands on them and hug on them. And it was, it was like a promise. Oh, that's, that, uh, that's a great, great story. And you had a wonderful family and a special relationship with your sister. Yes. That is, yes. That's uh, touching. It really well, is. It, it was wonderful to have that. Many yes. people did not have that. No. Mm -hmm. So we were blessed. And Tupelo turned out to be a wonderful home and continues to be. <laughs> so, Well, when you, in reading the book, I discovered that you were the first wife of a POW with a family to yes, come Yes, but home. back then they called them detained by hostile forces. But at that time, he was still MIA. We didn't know. Or did I always knew he was alive? I knew yes. it here, right? But you encountered a few complications when you got home. Yes, and uh, I love your feisty spirit and how you handled these. Tell us about uh, uh, how you got your Smitty's salary or his pay. You were not going to receive the whole amount. You had three small children. Tell us what you did. Well, you know, as long as I was in Okinawa, there had not been a problem because our squadron knew 
that right. I had full power of attorney, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I hit Washington, D.C. with three babies, essentially. Yeah. And I had this little apple cheat lieutenant who came and informed me that the decision had been made that I would continue to receive a $350 allotment, which had always gone to Smitty's dad's bank. He was a banker in Maryland. I said, what are you talking about? And I was a bit fatigued. And uh, I was told by the nuns at St. Genevieve's where I had been educated that I was cheeky. And uh, I guess I was. Uh, and you add cheeky and fatigued together and you're a little right, more than cheeky. Right. So he, I, he said, well, the Secretary of the Air Force has decided that uh, the wives of men who are in your husband's status will receive $350 a month and the rest will be put in a very nice savings program. And I said, well, that's just lovely, but I can't live and support three children as my husband wants me to do on $350 a month. And he said, well, that's the decision of the Secretary of the Air Force. And I said, tough, get him on the phone as soon as we get to <laughs> my husband's family's house. And he said, lady, I can't talk, call the Secretary of the Air Force, I said, you do the calling and I'll do the talking. And he said, I can't do that. And I said, oh, yes, you will. You're here at my disposal. So we, and he argued, I, the children and mother rode with Smitty's parents. I rode with him to the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And I promise you, he was as white as your blouse by the time we got there. <laughs> and, uh, but when we got there, I said, call him. And he was arguing, all, I said, you call him, and you call him now. And by now it was two, you maybe were a little testy. Yes. Right. So anyway, he calls and he thrusts that black handset, which they used to have, yeah. those were the black day phone yeah. Uh, yeah. days. And so he thrust it at me and I said, good afternoon. And he said, ma'am, uh, this is the Secretary of the Air Force. I said, I know who you are, I called you. And uh, he said, uh, do you have a problem? I said, I certainly do, and you have to solve it today. And I explained what it was, and he said, well, this is our decision, and we think this is the best thing for the men. I said, that's terrific. How do I th feed three babies and put a roof over our head on $350 a month? And I said, I have a general power of attorney and the backing of the last few months from the squadron and I said they know that I have these papers and I said what's more I know my legal rights and I said I actually worked as a legal secretary before my husband and I married and I know what I'm going to do and Good I said you. you have until close of business today that would be 5 p.m. to change this ruling because I will call a press conference if you don't get it changed <laughs> and he said well I'll have to have time to think on this and I said 5 p.m. close of business today. And what happened at 5 p.m.? Well, he didn't wait till 5 p.m. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, he called me back about an hour and a half later and he said, well, Miss Harris, I've taken under consideration uh, your knowledge of the system and the fact that you do have a full power of attorney. And he said, I've checked all this out and I will grant your wishes. And I said, that's very nice of you, uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you. What you did for yourself was remarkable, and, and you, but it the hard. other wives of POWs and their families uh, got to take advantage of, of, of a better that situation really, because yes. of what you did. If they had the same papers that I had, which all commanders in most right. units had given the same advice, the right. men were told before they rotated what they needed to do. And if they had walking around sense, they did it. And Smitty certainly has walking around sense. Uh, so anyway, we we got that carried through. So. Another complication you had, when you tried to buy a house, which was next door to your sister Janice and her family, yes, um, you applied for a VA loan. Mm -hmm. And um, I they explained those rules to me and they said, well, you have to have a letter from your husband stating that you can buy that particular house. I said, you know, that would be delightful, but he is locked up in Hanoi right. and I can't get a letter from him, period, much yeah. less 
saying that I could buy this particular house. And I said, if I could do that, I wouldn't need the house because we'd be together. Yeah. And I said, I intend to have this house. And they said, well, there's not a thing we can do for you. I said, but I can do something. So I called Senator John Stennis, God love him. Beautiful Southern. He was a Voice, wonderful yes. Southern gentleman. Yeah. And I explained my situation to him and in his wonderful Southern draw, yeah, he, he said, is. well, now, Miss Louise, we'll just take care of this. I don't think there's going to be a problem. And sure enough, the next day, the head of the VA from Jackson was knocking on my front door and saying, Miss Harris, we're here to help you get your VA loan. And sure enough, I had it multi-pointy. That's a, that's <laughs> a great story. Um, to me, one of the most miraculous things in the book was, was the story of the letter um, that Smitty wrote. And he was in the uh, prison in, in Hanoi. And somehow or other, that letter got to Louise Harris in Tupelo, Mississippi. Address it just, just was way. providential, I do believe. Yes. Can you tell us how that, what happened? Well, Smitty said he, it was the time that he taught the other fellows the tap code. Yes. And they were in confinement, and their intent, Vietnamese intent, was to show it as propaganda to some diplomats who were there. And they had shown them the letters, and they had no intention of mailing them, but they led the diplomats to believe that they would. And so it was addressed and everything to me. And the English, a lady diplomat from England, pinched my letter and put it in her purse. And when she got back home, and they were evidently on a trip because the dates between the time it was mailed and the time she obviously was overseas, she pinched that letter. When she got back to England, she mailed that letter. And so one afternoon, the children were already home from school. Uh, I got a call from the postmaster Mr. Banks Livingston. Mr. Yeah. Banks Livingston. And he said, Miss Harris, he said, I have a letter for you here. And he said, I think it's from your husband. And I said, you what? And he said, if you'll meet me on the back steps of the post office, I will give it to you. Well, I, my niece was home from school too. And so she came rushing over and stayed with the children. I jumped in my little yellow station wagon and roared to the post office. And he met me on the back steps. And I hugged his neck and he hugged mine and we did a little jig on the back steps of the post office. I went roaring home because I wanted the children to see it before yeah. I opened it, which took all the restraint I had. Right. And sure enough, it was Smitty in his handwriting and it was beautiful. And it was a real letter. That is a, a and miracle. And so I immediately called Smitty's mother and dad and read it to them. And then I called the Pentagon and they said, will you mail us the letter? And I said, what are you gonna do with my letter? <laughs> <laughs> but we had an agreement that I would send them the original, but they had to promise to send the original back to me. Yes. But it changed his status from detained by, um, missing in action to detained by hostile forces. So it was one of those highly elevated days of total joy. Yeah, no. Well, I it wonder if the letter would have even gotten to you if you'd lived in a huge I metropolis to. area. But, you know, in Tupelo, everybody knew, knew everybody. each other. Yes. And he called me, and it was a glorious day. But there was a lot of, um, of course, there were a lot of anti-war protesters who yes. were cruel to and unkind to some of the Yes. families of POWs, yes. but you did not encounter that in Tupelo. Not one bit, and I think if I had, the people of Tupelo would have stomped them. <laughs> I really <laughs> do. <laughs> and I would get calls from time to time yeah. from my casualty officer, particularly my one in Washington, and yeah. he said he was coming to Tupelo, which was another funny story, because at that time we didn't have good air service. And so Claude was coming to Tupelo, and he said, Louise, if you encountered any problems, I said, Absolutely not. But he was cut flying into Tupelo that evening and he arrived and he was two hours late and they'd lost his luggage and every hair on his head was standing on end. He said, 
I know why they haven't arrested you. They can't find you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I never had the first problem. And I really believe if, if I'd had a problem, people would have been all over them. Because people allowed us to be private, but they also took very good care of us. And I don't think I would have ever, ever. But many of my friends did. One of our good friends, Robbie Reisner's first wife, right. had to crawl from the bedroom portion of her house across the living room floor to get into her kitchen. I mean, they really, they would throw things at her windows and yell outside all the night. I mean, it was terrible. Well, let's go to January um, 1973, January the 28th, 1973. It was a cold January day, mm -hmm. and there were about 200 people here at the library. And you were here with Miss Robbins, and what were the two of you doing? Well, we were here to plant magnolia trees. Right. One for Miss Robbins' son, Doug right. Fowler, and one for my husband, Smitty Harris. Right to honor them and to, we both by then knew they were alive. And uh, we were honoring them by planting those trees in their honor and in the future prospect of watching them grow. And uh, Ms. Robbins was a dear friend. And so we were here planting them and as usual in Tupelo, people turned out for those occasions and we were here to honor them. And General Guy, Guy F. Lee, this is, this is unbelievable. At the end of the ceremony, he came up to you and he said what? He said, Miss Harris, he said, I'm General Guy Gravely, and of course I knew who he was. He was a dear man. And he said, I have some news for you. And I kind of gulped and uh, he said, the peace accords have been signed in Paris. And he said, the prisoners will be released. We don't have a date yet that they're going to be released. And he said, except for the injured, they will be released in order of shoot down date. And of course, Smitty was number six captured, so I knew he'd be on the right, first plane. Right. <laughs> and I was so excited. I cannot, I, I just fell into Ms. Robin's arms and she into mine and we hugged each other. And of course we hugged all over General Gravely. All right. <laughs> And we all, everybody was dancing around and celebrating out there. And even though we didn't know when they'd be home, we knew they'd be they home. They were coming. Well, we will end there. And this, the book does have a happy ending. It's a love story. And it's a story, like I said, of patriotism and courage and faith. It's a wonderful read. And um, I encourage everyone to read it. Well, we do too. But the thing is, it's a happy story. It's a happy story. It yes. is. And, and there's humor in it. There's yes. Humor. Yes. 61 and three quarters years later, it's still a happy story. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> well, I'm here at Veterans Park on a beautiful day with Colonel Smitty Harris. And, and uh, Colonel Harris, thank you again for your service and, and for the inspiration that, that book gives us about you and Louise and, and just- I gained so much from that service. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know in, in, in retrospect uh, you did, but thank, thank you for, uh, for everything. Um, I know April 4th, 1965 was the day that you were, you were shot down. Yes. But uh, I think people might be interested. How does, uh, I think you were what, 35 then? 30? Uh, I was a week away from being 36. Yeah, uh, almost 36. Uh, tell us how uh, a young boy uh, got interested in flying and ended up uh, at age 35 in an F-105 uh, in Vietnam. Well, tell us from, a little bit about your background. When I was a little tiny boy, probably three or four years old, I was playing with model airplanes uh, that you could purchase. Uh, there was very little plastic available then. Yeah. They were real iron steel yeah. <laughs> little airplanes. Yeah. I know. But uh, as I grew up, I had a close, close friend who lived directly across the street. And he and I both got interested in building models out of balsa wood yeah. and, and crepe paper and uh, powered by rubber bands 
attached mm -hmm. to a propeller that mm -hmm. you wind up. Mm -hmm. And we built and flew those. And as we got a little older and had a little bit more money to, because we were working out on the farm, uh, had a little money, we purchased engines for our little models <laughs> yeah. that we built. Yeah. And it was called U-Control because each airplane was hooked to two wires and a handle and you could make the elevators go up and down. And so we'd get our friends to start about 50 feet away or so and start the engine and let it go and then we would fly it. And sometimes when some of the airplanes got a little older and we didn't care, <laughs> we would attach a piece, a roll of, of crepe paper, glue it to the tail about 12 feet long. And one of us would start, have our airplane over here started, the other one over here. And the object was to cut the other person's crepe paper streamer <laughs> with the prop of your airplane. So you were fighter pilot uh, so, even then. So we were all over the sky and uh, we- That's a great story. Crashed a few air yeah. those airplanes too. Let's jump to, um, to your service. You were in Okinawa, the war just really, the Air Force was part of the war, just really started. Um, your mission that day, uh, I guess you, know, you had maybe started to realize it, but uh, uh, we were talking about the bridge that was your, your target, uh, how reinforced with anti-aircraft uh, the North the Vietnamese had it made it and was just very, a very dangerous mission. It's turned out to be a very dangerous mission. It was a very, very important bridge to North Vietnamese. They had built it after the French were defeated at uh, Dien Bien Phu in 1954. And they made sure that their first big bridge was going to be substantial. And they had huge steel I beams and concrete and stone abutments. It was going to be there a long time. And unfortunately, we were carrying, uh, well, I was carrying eight 750 pound bombs the day I was shot down. And that's a pretty big bomb. And so, so go but, over the, the mission then. You're, you're headed down, well, recounted as, as, as much as you want to. <laughs> unfortunately, on April the 3rd, the day before I was shot down, our squadron flew a mission on this bridge and uh, they were using bullpups, which is an air to ground uh, missile that had a warhead equivalent to about 250 pound bomb. And you actually had a little stick over here and you flew the airplane with this stick and you flew the um, rocket with your left hand, you know, and let it aim it at the target. Yeah. During all of that time, you had to, you were only in about a 30 degree uh, dive bomb or, or run, yeah. and you were very, very vulnerable because you were had to keep the airplane pretty stable for a long time yeah. while the missile was going So you in. weren't doing any No, dodging. you couldn't yeah. chink anyway and guide the, the yeah, that's, missile itself. Yeah, that's, that's tough. So uh, on that day, those bull pups, as we call them, just bounced off the steel and concrete structure. I think we broke some of the uh, concrete on the road bed, but that's about all, and it could be repaired easily. And, but they didn't, we saw that they were not very good at all. Yeah. So the Pentagon, headed up by Department of Defense, Robert McNamara, and he reported to Johnson, our president. And uh, they said, okay, we won't use bull pups. We'll use 750 pound bombs and uh, fly the same mission you flew on the third same place, same same place, same time, came in at the same altitude, 
uh, about 17,000 feet. They saw us coming for probably 100 miles away, and they had all of the guns that they could possibly get yeah, really. around there, 35 millimeter and 85 millimeter anti-aircraft guns that were uh, radar controlled as far as where they yeah. had what altitude they detonated. And uh, I happened to be, because I was in the last flight of four the previous day on the third, they put four of us with 750 pound bombs. 20 some before that had bulldogs. And so I got some hits on the uh, leading edge of the bridge and uh, one of my squatter mates, Ivy McCoy, good, good friend, got a direct hit right in the middle of the bridge. He was one of my own. I didn't know about that until later. Yeah. But uh, anyway, McNamara and Johnson said fly the mission that you did yesterday on oh, this time. Armament is different. 750 pound bombs for all, everyone. And we said, okay, and our- Those two great armchair quarterbacks. Yeah. yeah. Our squadron commander, who his name was Robbie Reisner, went, as soon as he got the order, he got on the phone to the wing commander at Okinawa, Kavita Air Base, and uh, said, let's change this order a little bit. Let's come in at dawn and all the way we'll come in on the deck below their radar and surprise them and we will pitch up to the altitude we need to and then roll in and get rid of our bombs and we have practiced this and we can do it. And they came, McNamara and uh, the Pentagon, whomever, came back and said follow orders. I never heard that part of the story. That's, uh... And so, because my flight of four had gotten the only 750 pound bomb hits the day before, uh, they let me roll in all by myself, no wingman, no nothing, while they were all at altitude seeing where my bombs impacted because it was in a gorge kind of bridge and the winds were unknown and they affected the bombs. They were not guided in any other way, except by the pilot when he released them. And uh, so I rolled in, and I think every gun in North Vietnam was shooting right at you. The, the, they were the waiting. The Ranger coming in. And uh, no, they just didn't have a I dropped my bomb and got some hits, for which they gave me the, the same response. Yes. <laughs> I think I had a pity. <laughs> but you deserve every medal you got and more, I'm sure. But at any rate, as I bottomed out at maybe 12 or 1500 feet, pretty low, and going about 600 miles an hour, one of their guided uh, anti aircraft rounds. You know, do you have any, do you have a, an estimate of uh, how high you were when you parachuted out? I'm going to guess around a thousand feet. Which isn't real high, <laughs> but well, well, you you have lived to, you have lived to tell about it, uh, and this book is a great story. We're going to talk about the book uh, uh, when we get together at the library with Sarah Barry and, and your wife Louise. Good. But uh, again, well done. We're, we're proud to have you as a, a friend, a citizen, an American, and uh, and it's just a wonderful book. I hope everybody. I this am year, so totally blessed. I live here in Tupelo at my age with my wife. Yeah. And uh, it's been a wonderful life. Well, you've added to our life. Thank you. Thank you. What a beautiful day in Tupelo and what a beautiful day at Veterans Park. Um, I know all of us in, in Tupelo uh, and in the surrounding area, really in Northeast Mississippi, are so proud of, of this park. It honors our veterans in, in so many ways. And the, the flags, uh, the different monuments to all the different wars that have been fought. And, men uh, and women that have, that have participated in them. Uh, this is really a, a sacred spot and one of the things that, that the uh, committee wanted to do in choosing TAPCODE this year is to remind people of this Veterans Park and of the, 
how special it is and, and encourage people to come out and take advantage of it. Um, of course, uh, primarily the reason we're here today uh, is I'm with uh, Colonel Smitty Harris. And Smitty, if you don't mind, I'll call you Smitty. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're friends. But uh, the, um, the book Tap Code starts with uh, primarily with the, with the day you were shot down. And we're going to go take a look at the F-105 in a minute. But uh, it also, uh, of course, uh, as terrible as your BOW experience was, there were too many people, too many young people did not come. And this Vietnam Memorial Wall, which is, I believe, is only the second one in America that's 60% the actual accurate wall that uh, people can see in Washington. So if you don't have a chance to make it to Washington to see the actual wall, to be able to see an exact replica at 60% of it, it is really a blessing for us uh, to do that. And, and, and while I want to call up Jane Alexander who helped us make this a possibility, but uh, Smitty, I know uh, there were some of the men you served with it, both in your squadron and then as fellow POWs that, that didn't make it home that, that are on that wall. Talk a little bit about those fellows. Okay, well, to begin with, this is a great tribute to the people of Tupelo and others who made this happen in such a beautiful park that is so meaningful to so many, many people. Um, they're over 5,000 names on that wall, and they're all recognizing veterans who fought in the Vietnam War. And uh, every one of their names is etched there, and family members can come up with a piece of paper and a pencil and make rubbings and have them framed even yes, later on at their home, just as a reminder of their service and uh, I just think it's a, a wonderful addition for Mississippi not just to Jane is the come come on up here she when I was mayor I had a lady walk up uh, and just come into the mayor's office and say uh, that I protect they said well two ladies here both of them want to talk to you about something and I said come on in and they, tell, tell me what you had on your mind I said, Mr. Reed, can we build a replica of the Vietnam Wall out in Veterans Park? He said, yeah, go meet with the park commission right now. <laughs> and said, we were rather in shock. <laughs> well, you thought I was going to have to, to, to consider it. I thought, well, when I heard y'all's plan, I said, I don't need to consider that. That's a wonderful idea. We just need to do that. And, uh, and here it is. And, here, and, and it's an example of, of just the community coming together uh, for the right reasons and, and being positive, but it takes private leadership like that too. Uh, you know, uh, political people at, at their best can can help, but it's it's the citizens, really the hearts of the community that really make communities. And I just want to, uh, on behalf of everybody, thank you for it, driving this and making this possible. Uh, there were many uh, people involved. I know they were they many sure people. Were. They sure I was uh, the but lesser one, but it's your vision. It's your vision. I just want to say thank you and, from all of us for this and, and for many days uh, ahead of us. Thank you to Mr. Harris, and thank I'm you. glad you survived and thrived. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, there, there's a point there. Not only did we thrive, but it, the longer we stayed there, the tougher we got. And looking back at those eight years, the friends we made and the things we learned and the things we went through. Uh, we look back now with uh, the net effect on our lives has been positive. It's a remarkable statement. It is. It's a remarkable statement. Well, y'all are both, y'all are both heroes to me. Thank you. And I think we're not just going to take a look um, at the, the, the st slate piece, I guess, of what we call honoring uh, Colonel Harris at the wall. Thank you.